Hello lovelies, I'm Tara and today we're going to be talking about all the things that I loved in February and March because I didn't do a February eight back. So as you can tell, we're in a bit of a different scenery here today. I've brought you into my bedroom. I know, it's a little forward, but I've been on YouTube for almost a year, so I think we know each other well enough that we can share the space. Hopefully. Anyways, as usual, we'll talk about a few things here and then we'll flip around and have a look at some decks. So don't worry, we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk about some just kind of random general things that I really loved over the last couple months. So one really big highlight was my dad and I have actually been doing this course called Earth or Something Like It. This is a course through the edX website where they host free courses. I don't know if it's just Ivy League schools or um, universities in general. The course that we did was a Harvard course and it was about the study of, or sorry, the search for potential life on other planets and other planets that could potentially host life. So this was really awesome. My dad and I have both always had an in interest in astronomy. My dad in particular loves the stuff about like the Hubble telescope and all that kind of thing. So we thought this was something cool that we could do together. We just jump on a Skype call once a week and read through the content together, discuss it. It's been so fun. My parents actually don't even live too far away. They live about an hour away, so it wasn't really convenient to do it in person together, but it was really easy doing it online together. And we liked it so much that we actually started another one. So the one that we're doing now that we just started is like a world history one that kind of looks like at the birth of time as we know it into the 1400s. And then there's another one that we can do after that's like the 1400s to the 1800s maybe. Anyways, we'll see how this one goes, but we're already loving it. So very excited. Another like family related highlight was I got to spend a weekend with my sister because her husband was away in somewhere in South America. I don't remember where. <laughs> anyway, she was all alone in her house and she's like, come stay with me, we'll have a sleepover. And as adults, we don't get to do that very often. So it was awesome to spend a weekend with her. We actually just spent the entire time reading cards together. So it was so fun. I brought over the Garden Dragons Oracle journey tarot, the Drew craft, and the cottage rhetorical. So they were all awesome. A couple highlights as far as things we watched. We watched the Francis Ngannou fight. So this was a boxing match. I don't really talk about it on this channel very often because it's not really related to the general theme here, but I do love combat sports. I love mixed martial arts. I love boxing. I love watching UFC. I just think it is like the purest most like primal type of competition and I love it. So I'm not sure if I already said it because I went on a bit of a tangent, but the Francis and Ghani fight was a boxing match. It was like a very high, highly publicized boxing match because Francis and Ghani was a champion in the UFC. I think he was a heavyweight and he's just an incredible fighter. And he had already had one boxing match, which was very high profile and it was awesome. So he had this one, he did lose, but I really hope that he continues with it because he's an incredible athlete. The other thing that we watched and loved was Impractical Jokers. This was a show that we used to watch all the time, like pre 2020. And we would like die laughing the whole time. It's like these three friends who go out around, I think it's like usually New York and they do pranks on people, but it's kind of like a competition between the three of them. Like two of them will invent like a really dumb like play or something like that. And the third guy will have to try and like sell tickets for it or something and explaining this like very stupid concept. So, <laughs> and if like he can get the tickets sold, then that person wins. So anyways, it's, it's a hilarious show. I think it was like, I think they put a pause on it for a few years. And I think that they filmed the season that we're watching now last year. And I was a little bit worried. I thought like with that break, maybe they would like soften their content or a little bit, a little bit or something like that because their humor is very politically incorrect, very irreverent. Personally, I think we take things very seriously in this day and age. And I think that adding a little bit of laughter and levity to most situations, is not a bad thing. And so I was really Happy to see that they stayed true to form and it was just hilarious and I can't wait to keep watching it. I love them. I also started my plants for my garden. So some stuff we wait until we can actually put the seeds directly in the ground, which we're not gonna do yet because we're still at risk for frost until like the end of May. 
So we probably won't put anything in the ground until around June 1st. But inside, I could start squash, zucchini, tomatoes. I started a bunch of herbs. I think I did basil, cilantro, dill, and mint. What else do we have? Oh, and a whole bunch of peppers. But things like beans, peas, they grow really fast. And I find if I start them inside, then they get like all tangled up and stuff. And then by the time that I transplant them, they're just so damaged, <laughs> they just die. And carrots, we grow a lot, but I don't like starting them inside either. I think that they do better when I put them directly in the ground. So still experimenting a lot. This is only our third year doing this. I am by no means an expert. I do do some research, but it's still a lot of trial and error. Bookbinding, I, this is like the longest bookbind of probably anyone's life. Like people do these things in like a day. This has taken me months, but I started binding. So Krista, from Krista Chronicles, I bought her Cottage Witch Oracle. And with that, she does have a physical copy you can buy online. This is definitely not it. Hers is much more beautiful than this. But I printed out the PDF copy of hers on this like ivory kind of, kind of paper, on ivory paper. And I decided I was gonna try to do bookbinding with this guidebook. So you can't really see probably that well from this distance, but I definitely made some mistakes. There's some loops on here that like are a little bit loose and stuff like that, but basically if you're not familiar, you basically create parts of the book in what we call signatures. So how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five. So I only have five in this one. I think this is like a 136 page guidebook or something like that. And then you fold all the signatures, well, you fold all the pages individually, then you put the signatures together, then you poke holes in the signatures. So one of the things that I would do differently is I would make the holes bigger. I made them so small and I was like really hurting my thumb trying to get the needle through to sew it. And then when I was sewing it, the thread itself I think is a little bit thick. This is thread that came with like just like a starter kit for book binding that I got. So I didn't really expect it to be like amazing quality or anything like that. I might try it again if I have like the bigger holes in the signature, but anyways, I definitely learned a lot, but I did enjoy it. I am like proud that I completed this. This isn't like the book complete though. I am gonna put a hard cover on it as well. And I think I'm gonna like collage the front for decoration. So I'll definitely keep you updated with that. The video tutorial that I follow for this is Rajiv something. I'll link it below. He is adorable. His tutorial's great. The whole thing is an amazing experience because the tutorial technically is awesome, but he is just like a pleasure to watch. So my writing, I actually did quite a bit of writing the last couple months. I feel like with writing this book in particular, it's really been feast or famine kind of. But one thing that changed was my fiance actually, we had a week off last week and I was like, I want to get a lot of writing done during this time. And he was like, I'm gonna, hook you up. So he got me like a lift stand for my laptop and then he got me this keyboard. It's one of those cool like clicky ones and it has really pretty lighting on it too. And then he was like, well now that you have a keyboard you need a mouse too. So he got me a mouse to kind of fit the theme. Anyways, it did actually make me want to write more. And I do enjoy the sensation of like typing on this keyboard but I'm definitely one of those people that I perform better if the setting that I'm doing the thing in is pretty. Last, but certainly not least, Hog has returned, our groundhog that lives under the shed. He is back, we're so relieved. Every spring, this is our third spring here? Yeah. Every spring we're like, is Hog okay? Is he, did he die? <laughs> is he gonna come back? And, so far he's come back every every spring so he's there he's looking very slim but he will puff out and we're just happy that he's back so we've seen him like rummaging around the backyard and he's very cute he actually doesn't like destroy our plants or anything like that surprisingly he does like root around in the lawn a little bit but we give him like offerings as well like if i'm cutting up some lettuce i'll keep the end for him or the end of a cucumber or whatever like you know that kind of stuff so we get some nice fresh veggies that we, we, we give to him as offerings to like not go after our garden stuff. So I think we have a pretty good understanding. Okay, so I did note down a couple things that I've been listening to that I've really been loving. So 
Curl Up and Clue In is a cozy mystery podcast that my friend Spencer from Intentionally Bookish does with her friend Courtney from Cortagonist. They're both on YouTube and Instagram, I believe. And they started this a few months ago. And I know I've talked about cozy mystery books on here a few times because there was a time in my life that I really, really loved them. I keep wanting to read them now, but never doing it. Maybe it's like nostalgic for me. I don't know. I do think I'll pick them up though. Like I have one on my bookshelf that I, I do hope to read one day. But their podcast, I mean, it's cozy as hell, obviously, because it's about cozy mysteries. But they're kind of theming the episodes. Like they'll do like destinations in cozy mysteries or like hobbies in cozy, cozy mysteries. So even if you aren't like a massive cozy mystery fan anyways, you might like the destinations that they talk about or the hobbies that they're talking about or something like that. So I've really been loving it. And then there was two podcast episodes that I listened to that I wanted to mention because I particularly love them. So the first one, I don't think it would be like a video of mine if I didn't talk about Africa Brooke because she is just my favorite. Her podcast is called Beyond the Self and it was episode 46. The title was My Deep Desire to Be Led by a Man. And I loved this so much. I feel like there's been a general kind of accepted way of talking about relationships between men and women for a long time in a way that feels negative to me. It feels like we don't need each other, that independence is the most important thing and all that kind of stuff. And I do think there's an argument for that. I do think independence is important. I don't think dependency is necessarily the way to go, but I do think that there's something very special about trusting someone enough to let them lead you. And that's kind of what I got out of that episode. So that's a way bigger conversation than I could do justice in this video. But if you're interested in that kind of thing in relationship dyna dynamics and like the dy dynamics between masculine and feminine and all that kind of stuff, you might like it. And then I can't believe I've never talked about this podcast on here before, but this past weekend, which is Theo Vaughn's podcast, which is a massive podcast, I don't necessarily think this is a new episode, but it's one that I've listened to recently. He has tons of episodes. This is episode 421, and I think it was just called Retired Police Officer. So he sometimes just interviews, like most of the time it's celebrities and comedians and stuff like that, athletes, famous people. But every once in a while he'll do an episode, like there was another one he did, it was like a New York city garbage man or something like that. And I love that he does that, but I just have a very soft spot for first responders, police officers, things like that, things like that, people like that, people that do those jobs. So I loved this episode. I thought it was very insightful, very fascinating, would highly recommend. So youtube -y type of things. There was quite a few highlights. First of all, Benny and Kelsey. So Benny, uh, his channel is The Fool's Apprentice. He had my friend Kelsey at Hoga Tarot on his channel. I think the series is called Tarot Chats. I was on it. He, uh, I think our episode is coming out this, the week that I'm filming this. I don't know when this video is going to come out, but it'll probably be out when you're watching this. <laughs> but he basically just invites people on within the tarot community onto his channel to chat about tarot. And he's such a wonderful host. He's so warm. He's so open. He really makes you feel comfortable as a guest, which is lovely. And Kelsey has just become one of my dearest friends. So seeing them come together for a chat and getting to see like two people that you love watching and engage in a conversation is awesome because a lot of the time we're just talking at the camera and there's a very different, it's a very different experience and dynamic and also like process in conveying your ideas when it's through a conversation rather than like a speech. So, love that. Speaking of Kelsey, our little series, Capsule Cards and Coziness. So, of course, we did our February and March Capsule Cards live. So, this is a live we do every month. February, we did it just Kelsey and I. But in March, we had our first ever guest, which was Krista from Krista Chronicles. She was so enthusiastic and supportive and amazing when we started doing this series. She still is. And... We were like, let's like ask if she wants to come on. So she said yes. She's an amazing sport. She was awesome to have on. We loved the dynamic of like having a guest on. So much so that actually our April Live, which we filmed on March 31st, 
we had Angie from A Cup of Tarot on. So she's active, she has a YouTube channel, but she's active on Instagram. I don't think she really posts any videos, but her Instagram, she posts a lot of reels, a lot of content, it's awesome. So loved having them both on. They both brought such unique vibes and perspectives to the live and tarot and all that kind of stuff. So I love doing that series with Kelsey and uh, I'm, I'm so excited to see where it goes. In February, I started my own series of tarot study sprints on my channel. So this is a live I'm doing once a month. The next one is April 14th. And what I'm doing is having a bunch of guests on from the tarot community and we're doing study sprints. So what we do is we all come on, we chat about what we're going to be studying. It's the whole theme is like obviously tarot or tarot adjacent. And then we set a timer for 30 minutes, mute our mics and we study. And it's been awesome. People have been jumping in the chat and sharing what they're studying. I'm pretty sure they're joining, they, they definitely are joining our, our sprints as well. And then after the 30 minute sprint is done, we all jump back on, discuss what we've just read and studied. And then the two sprints that we've done, we I think we've done like the two dates that we've done the sprints, we've done three sprints during the live. So that's an hour and a half worth of studying. So the live has been around two hours, a little over two hours kind of thing. So I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna try to have like a diverse group of people on the studies. You'll definitely see some returning faces, but it's been great. It's been a great way to meet people, to learn about different things, to kind of see how people study too, like how people annotate or translate or whatever they're doing. It's, it's been cool. And then the last highlight over the last couple of months is Glitter and Gators, which is Lisa and Danny's new live series that they're alternating between their channels. I think they're doing it once a month and like one month they'll do it on Lisa's channel and the next month they'll do it on Danny's channel. But Lisa and Danny are two of the three, Don Michelle being the third, um, two of the three people that made me fall in love with tarot and tarot tube. Those three are the three people that I started watching when I first got into this subscribed to them, was totally and still am totally committed to their content, so inspired by them, and to see Danny and Lisa start this next chapter just warms my heart. So congratulations Lisa and Danny, we love you guys and we love what you're doing. Okay books, oh my gosh, there's a lot. Okay so, oh also side note, I always have my Notion site linked in the description down, down there. <laughs> in the bottom. And on my Notion site, I started tracking all of my fanfics. So if you guys are into fanfics or if you're curious about them, I started a list of all the ones that I've either read or want to read. So I have them listed in, I have the names obviously, I have the links, which I as a fanfic reader really appreciate when people do that because sometimes I'll try to like type in the title and a bunch of different things will come up and I'm not always sure if I'm finding the right one. There was one time where I actually started reading the wrong fanfic because there was two of the same title. Anyways, so I add the links in there, I add the fandom. Every single one that I have on my list currently is Harry Potter except for one. I have one Star Trek one on there. I am open to other fandoms, like I would love to read some Star Wars, maybe Dune. I'm open. But I'm, in, I'm very in love with the Harry Potter fanfics right now. I also have a column where you can sort by the relationship. So if you're looking for a Severus and Hermione, or a Lucius and Hermione, or a Harry and Draco, or a Hermione and Draco, or whatever, you can sort by that. Then I have for myself, um, whether it's red, if I DNF'd it, or if it's just uh, TBR. What else do I have here? I did add tags as well. So if you want to sort by like enemies to lovers, steamy, Arranged Marriage, EDSM, Friends to Lovers, whatever your flavor is. I also add notes after I finish reading them and then the date that I finish reading them. So all that being said, I'll tell you about the ones that I read in February and March. Okay, so the first one I'll talk about is called An Accidental Affair. This was a Severus Snape and Hermione, Enemies to Lovers, very funny, very steamy, and it was a quick read. I can't remember how long this one was, but it, it felt like a quick read to me. So this is one where Hermione's all grown up. She's now working in a museum. She's a little bit downtrodden. She's hit some speed bumps in her life and she's a guard at this museum. So Snape comes in one day with his class. He's still a teacher at Hogwarts. 
they end up getting in an argument and they end up destroying this like historical artifact that is a book and it's a book about sex basically <laughs> magical sex so the owner or manager or whatever the boss of the museum is like you guys have to replace this so they get together and they're like even if we could find a replacement it's going to be super expensive and we can't afford it so their solution is to try and rewrite it and pass off their rewritten copy as an original because they're like this book was massive no one's gonna know word for word what was in it we know the general theme we'll just rewrite it so them writing like all of the steamy scenarios and instructions and all that kind of stuff guides them into their own romance and like i said super steamy it was a fun one i also read an arrangement of mutual advantage this was a lucius and hermione pairing which is my favorite this was I, the tags I put were pure smut, enemies to lovers, steamy, funny, arranged marriage. This was a really quick one as well. And this one is a basically, again, Hermione is years out of Hogwarts. She's now working at the Ministry of Magic. And she's having a really hard time getting like, her ideas, getting traction on them and getting things done. And Lucius has a seat on some kind of council that like approves things. And he basically comes to her because he's noticing her struggle and he's like, I'll make a deal with you. If you marry my son, I'll make sure you get a seat on this council so you can push things through quicker. And I know I said this was a Lucius and Hermione romance and it is. And I, because it's such a short read, I don't want to like give too much away, but that's all I'm going to say. Okay. And the last one that I'll talk about is one of my new favorite fanfics books, maybe that I've ever read. It's called What's Past is Prologue. This is a, again, Lucius and Hermione romance. This is an enemies to lovers and it is a slow burn. And I know I've said before, like I'm weird about slow burns. Like if someone tells me something is a slow burn, I'm a little bit put off, like I'm less likely to read it, but I've read some amazing slow burns. They just have to be done right, like everything. So in this one, again, we have an adult Hermione who is working at the ministry, but she's actually taken like a bit of a sabbatical because she wants to write a book based on an oral history that she's getting from people who experienced the wizarding wars. So she's talked to a whole bunch of people, but the one person that she really wants to interview is Lucius Malfoy because he's like, I think the only or one of the very few Death Eaters that didn't end up in Azkaban. He is under house arrest. So when we start the book, she has just finished interviewing Draco, and Draco is a reformed man. He is absolutely lovely in this book. He's seen the error in his ways, and he's become a better man for it. And she's like, I really want to interview your dad. It would mean so much. He was in both Wizarding Wars. He was a Death Eater. Like, it would be really great to have that perspective. So Draco's like, all right, I'll try and help you out. So anyways, obviously, after, like, months of harassing Lucius, he finally gives in, they start their interview process, and can't resist each other's germs. Okay, that was all the fanfics I read. So for books, I read Where the Truth Lives by Mia Sheridan. So this is book two in a duet, I guess you would call it, but they're two different stories. The second book is like the next generation. So this book is about the son of a heroine from book one. I do think you should read them both. Like, I don't think you could read this one independently because there's a lot about this story that has to do with everything that happened in book one. So this is like a romantic suspense about a detective. He's our hero. I forget his name. Reese? We'll just call him detective. <laughs> so our, de our detective hero is the son of the heroine from book one. And he was born because his mother had been raped by a serial killer. So he obviously is dealing with a lot when it comes to that. And now he's a detective because he feels like that's his way of being something positive in the world and, and feeling like he has to make up for the sins of his father kind of thing. And then our heroine also has an incredibly traumatic past. Her, her sister, and her brother lived with an incredibly abusive father. It was absolutely sickening. Her brother was totally unhinged, probably as a result of all of the abuse, and actually murdered her father, her sister, and tried to murder her as well. 
So she's dealt with a lot herself as well. She is now a psychologist, psychiatrist, I forget which one. And the way that our hero and heroine meet, as if their lives weren't traumatic enough, our heroine finds a dead body at her boarding place that was brutally murdered. So our detective hero goes to her job to investigate, they meet, and our story begins. So like I said, this is a romantic suspense, murder mystery, it's a serial killer, and I loved it. I've said it a million times, I love Mia Sheridan. I, I've literally never written, or written, I've never read one of her books that I didn't love. It was great. Then another author that I absolutely love, Miss Layla Fay. I read Tritzer, which is book number two in her Finger Licking Monsters series. I haven't read book one, and it does talk a little bit about the first story in this book, but you definitely don't need to read book one to understand this one. If you ever read Layla Fay, her stories aren't like overly complicated or anything like that. And I don't mean that as like to disparage these, these books or these stories or anything. I probably read more of her stuff than any other author. I just absolutely love her books. They're just my comfort reads and they're monster romances. <laughs> they're super smutty and they're totally insane, but they're awesome. They're so fun. So this is a Loki romance. And I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this one. I don't know if I would have picked this one up, but the reason that I did was she released it for free, the ebook for free, for I think a few days. And I was like, well, I'll grab it. And I really loved it. It was super fun. It was actually like, way, there was way more plot to this one than some of her other ones that I've read. In this one, Loki kidnaps the heroine because like all gods do, they just see, you know, the person that they want and they, once they've decided that they want them, they just take them. So that's what he does. She's pissed. She <laughs> does not love it. I guess it's a, a kind of an enemies to lovers on her end. I would even say like for a Layla Faye, this is like a bit of a slow burn, but probably by like normal standards, it's not. It was really fun. There's also this element of like, there's this like overarching, like governmental type of entity that's trying to bring Loki down or get him kicked out of the world or I, f I forget what it is but there's kind of like that that battle going on as well so there's like a bit of like an element of danger and all this kind of stuff and I just love her books they're always very magical in the steamiest of ways and this one did not disappoint in that sense keeping rolling with the monster romance well this one is technically an alien romance but I got approved for an ARC, which I am very excited about. I've only ever applied for two ARCs, and this is the second one that I applied for, and I got accepted for it, or approved, or whatever. And I loved it. I, I, I kind of knew that I would, like I said. It's right off the hop. It's like, it looked like a very fun alien romance. It's called Jumping the Shark, Mass, Matt? No, Matched with <laughs> the Space Shark, First Date Abductions. If you know me at all, you know that is like, my lifeblood <laughs> for reading. So like I said, this is by Ash Raven. This is a story about our alien hero who is like a shark man, basically. And he's been participating in this like kind of matchmaking thing, which on the aliens end, like they have like full awareness of what's going on. I'm watching my cat because I feel like she's going to bump camera stand. Patty, don't bump it. <laughs> we bathed her today and she looks wild. Where was I? Okay, so the, the aliens participate in this matchmaking system, agency, something like that. On the human's end, they think it's a dating app and they don't know that they're talking to aliens. They're seeing like, it's, it's catfishing big time on the alien's end. So anyways, our hero has been talking to our heroine. They have a connection. So his next step is to go to Earth to have a date with her, but also abduct her and bring her home. I know, it sounds terrifying. So he meets with her. There's instant chemistry. The heat is hot, is burning. <laughs> they have really good chemistry. And then he essentially, listen, a lot of the books I read like, in the books, I love it. I think it's great. In real life, absolute criminal behavior. So he, he essentially drugs her, abducts her, brings her to his home planet. She wakes up, 
And she doesn't miss a beat. She's totally down. She's a huge fan of sci-fi romances. So this is like her dream come true. She didn't have a whole lot that was keeping her on earth. So she's just like super attracted to him <laughs> and super into it. And they are definitely in their honeymoon phase and they're getting to know each other. And it was, it was very sweet. Like I found, I find this with a lot of like alien and monster romances. They're very sweet. I think that's why they, they feel like comfort reads to me. So anyways, this one was super sceny, very wild, alien, body parts are a thing in it. I loved it. Okay, so then on a totally different note, I read Asking For It, is that? Yeah, Asking For It by Lila Pace. So this is one that I don't think there's, I don't think this is in print anymore. I know you can get, I'm pretty sure you can get the ebook still, but I don't think that there's like physical print copies available anymore. I got this one uh, used too. This is actually a copy from the New York Public Library, which I think is kind of cool. But even a couple years ago when I bought this, they weren't doing, it, it was out of print. So this is a very dark romance. Let me first say I loved this, because I'm going to say a lot of things that might sound like I didn't love it. I loved it a lot. This is also a duology, and I am going to read the second part of this couple's story. But like I said, this is a super dark romance. I think the author puts, yeah, she puts like a reader advisory on the back. I don't know how in detail she goes. Um... If you're curious, but you're, oh, there is a part here in the back where she says, warning, this will include spoilers. And then she talks about like what the actual content warnings are. So I won't read them because I don't want to ruin them for anybody. But if you're, if you're curious, but you're nervous about reading a book like this, you know, check the reviews, Google it or message me. And I, I would be happy to try to give you as spoiler free as a warning as I possibly can. But what I do feel safe saying is that it's a consensual non-consent relationship that we're entering by our hero and heroine. They both have incredible trauma in their past that they feel like contributes to why they want this type of relationship. And obviously it's incredibly hard to find someone that will engage in a relationship like this. And neither of them are a super comfort comfortable <laughs> coming out to people and saying like, hey, I like you, but I like this, that, and the other in the bedroom, and it's not super conventional. Anyways, I don't want to spoil it too much, but this was a really beautiful story. I grew quite attached to both the characters, particularly the heroine, and the end of this book, even though it's, it, it's I, I guess, like a bit of a cliff... Well, no, it, I, I feel like saying it's a cliffhanger is like very dramatic, but it leaves you hanging a little bit. But there is a very satisfying element to the ending as well. Anyways, it was very steaming. It was very interesting for me to have this type of insight into like people have experienced these things and people that are into this type of thing. So really loved this one. This is another new favorite. This is The Madness of Lord Ian McKenzie by Je Jennifer? Yeah, Jennifer Ashley. This is book one in a series. I think the series is called The McKenzie's and the McBrides. Anyways, this is about a absolutely wonderful hero named Ian McKenzie. Our heroine's name is Beth. And once again, we have a couple who have been through some stuff. So Ian, this, this is a historical romance. So at the time, they weren't super great at diagnosing, you know, any type of neurodivergence or anything like that in people. But it is commonly agreed upon. It never says it explicitly anywhere in this book. But... A, I, I think every single person that I've seen talk about this book says, yes, this is a neurodivergent hero, and I think that's pretty clear. I would say, if I had to guess, that Ian is on the autism spectrum, but again, I don't know for sure. But he is a wonderful hero. He loves so fiercely and so protectively, even though he doesn't actually believe that he can love, and it's just because the way that he expresses his love is so different from the way that he sees people express it around him. But the story is Ian has this acquaintance who is bragging to him. This is the culprit that always interrupts my videos and she's all wet because we bathed her today and we tried to dry her but she just screamed at us. But yeah. Okay, so now that Patty's done screaming. So Ian has this acquaintance who's bragging to him 
about this woman that he's going to marry who's super rich. She's a widow. She just got all this money from a woman that she had become friends with after her husband died. And then that woman passed away and left her like a fortune. And Ian knows a lot of things about this man that he doesn't love. And he's like, I'm going to go to the opera that these two are going to tonight. And I'm going to tell this woman to watch out. When he meets Beth and he slips her a note into her glove about who her fiance truly is, he don't, she's going to bump my stand. Don't do it. He decides that he wants Beth. And so he just straight up says to her, don't marry this man. He's horrible. You should marry me instead. And she's like, why should I marry you? And he's like, because I want to sleep with you, which I know sounds like very not romantic, but <laughs> bear with me. He's like, well, you're not the type of woman who is just going to sleep with me. You're only going to sleep with someone that you're married to. Because again, don't forget, we are in historical romance. And he's like, so I want to sleep with you. So we should get married. I'll take care of you and all that good stuff. And she's like, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to marry this man anymore. Thank you for telling me he's horrible. I'm going to go off to France and paint because I'm rich and I can do whatever I want now. And she's going to live my dream life, essentially. Patty, what is going on? Do you want to come? Do you want to come up here? She's a very delicate old lady. Um, where was I? Where were you, Patty? Ah, yes. So off to France she goes to paint and Ian follows her. Sorry if you can hear that very loud purring. Anyways, there's this whole other element to this book, which is Ian has been targeted by, by this specific police officer who thinks that he is guilty of all of these horrible things. So there's kind of like a murder mystery aspect to this as well. But this is such a beautiful story. It's such a unique story. We have a very unique hero who is just absolutely lovely. So anyways, this is, like I said, it's a new favorite, would highly recommend. Okay, so then the last thing that I finished reading was The Highlander Who Protected Me. This is book one in Clan Kendrick, the, sorry, in the Clan Kendrick series. This is by Vanessa Kelly. This is my first time reading her. It's another historical Highlander romance. I loved this book for like the first two thirds. And then the last third, it just felt like a slog a little bit. And that being said, I read this because one of my really good friends absolutely loved it. There's plenty of people that absolutely love this book. So in this story, we have a Highlander hero who's named Royal. I don't remember the heroine's name, but Royal is a war veteran. He is a wounded war veteran. And he is absolutely in love with, I think her name is Ainsley, Lady Ainsley our heroine. Anyways, he's absolutely in love with her. He always has been, but she's betrothed to this horrendous man. And he actually goes as far as like kind of kidnapping her at one point to prevent her from having to marry this man. And she's like kind of into it, but not, I don't know. I was kind of conf like confused about how to feel about that whole thing. But what ends up happening to our heroine is right before she gets married, her fiance, rapes her and gets her pregnant. So naturally, thankfully, she decides there's absolutely no way I'm marrying this man. And her family is pissed because again, it's historical romance and the etiquette around such things isn't the best. So her family is like, no, it was a misunderstanding. You should still marry him. And she's like, no, he violated me. Um, they don't know that she's pregnant. But she's like, I'm not marrying him. So anyways, her family like sends her off to this like aunt in Scotland at some castle as like a punishment, but secretly she's happy because she's away from her family and she knows she's pregnant and she doesn't want anyone to know that she's pregnant because she's scared that if her ex finds out, he'll take the baby or for force her to be with him or whatever, something terrible is gonna happen. Anyways, our hero royal knows that she's in this castle close to where he lives and his family is like you should reach out to her see how she is all this kind of stuff so he goes to visit her finds her pregnant and ends up making a deal with her she begs him please take my daughter raise her as your own to keep her safe i have to go back to london and so the whole basis of this plan is like around keeping the child safe and away from 
cracks. Where the story kind of started to lose me was our hero was also, like, Royal was very careful with our heroine, which I think, like, if it wasn't that way, that would have bothered me. But she kept saying, like, no, I'm good. Like, I want to be with you. I'm comfortable with you. But then he was constantly like, is this okay? Is that okay? And, like, I, again, if that happened at first, I would have been like, yay, he's sensitive. He's considerate. But she kept saying, like, I'm good. And he kept being, like, so careful around her so it got like a little bit frustrating but I feel like a giant asshole even saying any of that so take that for what you will <laughs> okay so on to what I'm currently reading <laughs> so last but not least I am currently reading first of all this one which is a slave to slip slave to sensation by Nalini Singh this is book one in her Psy Changeling series which is I guess kind of like a paranormal romance series. This is a super super popular series in the romance world and I've read Nalini Singh before. I've read her Guild Hunter series Angel Kids. Some, I'll, I'll put it up here. Anyways I'm not very far on this one. I'm only a couple chapters in but the tension is already awesome between our hero and our heroine. What are their names? Sasha is our heroine. Lucas is our hero. So Lucas is a panther shapeshifter, aka a changeling, and Sasha is a psi, which is kind of like a emotionless human. It's like this subspecies of human that are like highly logical, highly intelligent, but they did something like with their brains to like stop them from feeling emotions and stuff like that so they could be more efficient. I think there was also like some kind of event where there was like a lot of like killings going on or something like that and I, I guess they were very emotionally motivated so their this species or, or race's solution was to remove that aspect of their minds entirely and as a result we have a whole race of people who are just pretty much robotic but they also like have telepathy and stuff like that like they can kind of like communicate with their minds and stuff like that so anyways so far our hero and our heroine have met they have kind of like a business deal between them and our hero is really reacting to our heroine and our heroine even though she's supposed to be very robotic she has a secret and that she does feel emotion and desire and all these kind of things but she has to keep that secret because if her own people find out she'll be thrown into like some Okay, my apologies if things look different. We had a battery die because we've had so many patty interruptions today. Anyways, if our heroine lets out that she has like essentially feelings, she'll be thrown into some like horrible hospital-esque prison type situation. So anyways, they are like feeling each other, but she can't show her feelings. And anyways, as I said, not that far into, but definitely enjoying it. I do love what I've read of Nearly Amazing. Yes, and I'm still reading this like 100 page, <laughs> it's, not, it's not long at all. Yeah, um, book by George, or or George Orwell, which is called Why I Write. I have been tabbing and annotating it quite a bit and writing notes in it and stuff like that. I am really loving it. The slowness in my reading it has nothing to do with the quality of the book itself. I just, I guess I feel like I can take my time more with this one because it's not a story that I feel like I remember, need to remember like the details of, it's more of a study. This is a book that he wrote about writing. It, it's exactly like the title says, why I write. So this is really fascinating listening to him talk about his own life and the political and world situation while he was writing, that being mostly like World War II and how that influenced him was World War II, right? I'm pretty sure it was World War II. Anyways, I, I love stuff like this. Anything about critical thinking, examining the world and politics and all that kind of stuff, I, I really love. So anyways, I have been loving this one. I also started during one of our tarot study sprints, sorry, this one is kind of, it got broken and shipping, but um, Kitchen Table Tarot by Melissa Sinova. Is it Melissa? Yeah, Melissa Sinova. This is a tarot tube darling. I would say a lot of people really love this book, and I've really been loving it too. Again, I'm not that far into it, 
but I have been like underlining and highlighting quite a bit. She does say in it that it, I don't want to misquote now. I'm pretty sure she says this is like a book for beginners. And although I don't consider myself a beginner, I still like find value in reading things like this because it's just like a, a different perspective, right? Okay, I don't want to misquote her and say that she said that this is for a beginner. I think I remember that, but I will read this. So I really liked this quote in this. It says, What this book shows, and what I want to teach you, is that you can pick up a card, see where it's going, remember a few feet, a, a few key words, and own the card. You'll have it. Once you have the card, you can't lose it again. It belongs to you, and you can embellish it as much as you'd like. I thought that was kind of cool. Oh my gosh, okay, what else am I reading? There is a, cu a couple, yes, I think just two other things. Oh, I also started Dark Notes by Pam Godwin. This is another dark romance. I've only read one other Pam Godwin book, which was Sea of Ruin, which I absolutely love. That was like a pirate dark romance and it was really incredible. This one is another dark romance. It's a t contemporary and I think I'm about 10 or 15% into the book. It's about, it's it's a taboo romance too. This is a student teacher romance and I'll t that's not even the dark part. So the dark part is a whole other thing. But so far we've met our heroine. Her name is Ivory. She is a student at this like, I, um, what I'm assuming is like a private school for the arts. Again, very sorry if you can hear the purse. Very loud. Um, so our heroine is at the, at the school. I can't remember if it's on a scholarship or it's something that her father arranged before he passed away, but she's living in like abject poverty right now. And everyone in the school is incredibly wealthy. So she feels like a major outcast. She feels like her ability to attend the school is on thin ice. Like she always feels like if she messes up or she's not the best or whatever, that she's gonna get kicked out and it's incredibly important for her to be at the school. She's a pianist and she wants to go off and be successful at that and do that as a career. And our hero was recently transferred as a teacher to the school because of a indiscretion that he had at his previous school. And they haven't said explicitly, but I think he had a own romantic relationship with a co-worker or something like that. It wasn't a student or anything like that, but he has some darkness and demons within him as well. So as far as I've read, they've just met and it was interesting. So I am really enjoying it. I do love Pam Godwin, but again, if you're sensitive to dark romance, look up any caution warnings. I don't know. Where do you want to go? There probably is some warnings associated with this book just because I know Pam Godwin and I know I've, I've heard a lot about this book. I know it's a dark romance. I haven't looked them up because like I said, I'm not impacted by them. But if you're curious about this, but you're worried you might be sensitive, look them up. I am listening to A Court of Thorn and Roses, even though I was pretty sure I was never going to do this. My best friend in the whole wide world was like, please please read this. And I already disappointed her once by not finishing Fourth Wing. So I figured I would give this one a try. My sister really loves the series as well. I oh, I never wanted to read it because it's not, in theory, it's not like something I would really love because it's a fantasy romance, which is like my favorite. But they just always sounded kind of YA to me. I don't know if they are technically YA or if someone in the comments might just absolutely call me out on that. I am like, because I'm listening to this one, it's hard for me to, I'm listening to the audiobooks. I'm listening to the dramatic audiobook as well, which I have kind of like a love-hate relationship with. But the way that they release it is they release the dramatic version of the audiobook in two parts, which is kind of annoying. So I listened to part one. I think I'm like a third of the way through part two. I am liking it. I am interested in it. I, If I was physically reading it, I don't know if I would be as motivated. Although there's parts in it that I don't love the dramatic reading of it and I'm like I would rather read this because then I would have my own like there would be my own voice and, and my own picture and all that kind of stuff in my head. So anyways I'm not really selling this and I'm not trying to. I don't think I need to. This is one of like the most popular book series right now. I, I'm gonna keep 
break watch or <laughs> watch. I'm gonna keep listening to it. I've heard from my sister and my best friend that book two in the series is actually like where it really starts to get great. So even though I am enjoying book one, I want to at least get to book two and kind of see how I feel after that. Oh my gosh, okay, that is everything that I want to talk about in this way. We're gonna flip. We're gonna do, I'm gonna do a triple back flip into my office and then we're gonna look at cards. Okay, thank you for joining me on my bed, Patty. I hope this wasn't too intimate for you. Maybe we'll be back here on another day. Let's look at some cards. Okay, so let's have a look at essentially two months worth of decks. So there are a couple that I'll mention, but I didn't end up using them. So we'll just talk about them. I won't show them. So in February, these two were part of my capsule collection that I selected. So this one is the Pussycat Tarot. And here is my favorite little Knight of Pentacles ever. And this is the Sacred Threads Oracle by Don Michelle. This is the pocket edition. So like I said, these were two of the decks that were in my February capsule collection. The other two were the Royal Dark Tarot and the Broadband Sisters Clearing Cards. I didn't end up using either of those at all. I only used these two exclusively. I think for one, I just wasn't in that mood in February for those kind of, kind of decks. And then these ones, I just really love together. I mean, I know right off the hop, they don't look like they go well together, but these two just... I don't know, they just did work really well. It's kind of one of those pairings that like, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. I think it's more when I get the cards that fit the color palette of this one a little bit better that it makes a little bit more sense. But I found like messaging wise, they read together really well. I love both of these. These two I don't think will ever leave my collection. I just love the simplicity, I guess, of both of them. I mean, the Pussycat Tarot is quite simple in its illustrations. And same with the Sacred Threads. Like I said, with the Sacred Threads before, I think it's that sense of space and solitariness that it brings to me. Both of these kind of have that vibe. So I think that they kind of fit well together in that sense. This is my favorite card in this deck, but... Anyways, I did love both of these in February and they did feel like seasonally for where I live at least, the, the color and the energy fit really well. So I know not like your typical February like romance and love, which you know I love very much, but still these were just kind of right for where I was at that month. Okay, so much like February, as far as my capsule collection is concerned, I only really used, actually that's not true. There was one other deck that I used quite a bit, which is the Cursed Aubrey's, but I won't show that because I don't have it at my desk. <laughs> but my capsule collection was these two, the Cottage Witch Oracle and the Earth Bones Tarot. I also selected the Druidcraft Tarot and the Brian Froud's Fairies Oracle. So the Druidcraft, I am going to pass along. I think my time with that one is done. The Brian Froud's Fairies Oracle will never leave my collection. It is a favorite. It was again just one of those things like I found like I wasn't really drawn to it that month for whatever reason. But these two I absolutely love together. I really loved um, the Cottage Witch Oracle with the Cursed Auguries Tarot as well. But I think it's just kind of more... I don't even want to say the vibe of these two together because like as I'm flipping through them together, maybe they'll look like they make more sense if I do it more the way that I actually use them, which was more so like this. Does that look like, does that, is that more convincing to you guys that they look good together? <laughs> I feel like the Cottage Witch Oracle just fits so well with everything. I love this card. I love, I love a good stag. But yeah, does that make more sense? I feel like that illustrates better. Let me just, let's actually be able to see these ones, right? That would be nice. Okay, so yeah, I often use them this way, like pulling um, one of Krista's oracles in the middle and then a tarot on each side. And yeah, I think it's just the vibe. It's not the aesthetic really. It's just, I think because they both have like a lot of like 
bones and animals and plants and stuff like that that they felt like thematically they fit. So as a consequence of that, they seem to read really well together. This one, I will say, has the expansion pack shuffled in as well. So if you get the like standard or original pack of the Cottage Witch Oracle, it might not necessarily have all the cards that I'm showing in here, but I do have them shuffled in and I don't remember what's what. So anyways, I really enjoy my time with both of these. The Cottage Witch Oracle is a new addition to my collection and the Earthbones Tarot I've had for quite a few years and I've always really loved it. And the Cottage Witch easily became a new favorite. Okay, and then there's three other decks that I kind of use outside of my capsule collection that I want to talk about. And I kind of use them together-ish. So, okay, let's talk about them independently first. That would make more sense, right? Okay, so the Journey Tarot is one that, I guess I'll show you the backs, they're really cute. Um, the Journey Tarot is one that I got in in February, I think? It was either March or February. Anyways, this was a Kickstarter that I had backed. It came in. I was super excited. I filmed a Pleased to Meet You. I was underwhelmed by the deck. <laughs> then that same night, I took him to my sister's and had an awesome time using it with her and actually reading with it and totally changed my opinion on it. So I decided not to upload my pleased to meet you that I filmed my first impressions just because I didn't feel like it represented how I actually felt about this deck now and especially within such like within like hours of like filming that and then my feelings change it, it just didn't feel right because I love this a lot now I didn't like not love it when I unboxed it but I kind of felt like it didn't live up to like what my expectations were of it and now I feel kind of dumb because I love it a lot. I think it's a great deck and it is actually part of my capsule collection for April and I've been using it right now and I've been absolutely loving it. Not only the deck but the guidebook as well. Like the whole experience has been great. So loving this one. I paired this one with my absolutely beloved. This is like, I, I, I want to say it's my new favorite deck like ever but I feel like it's too specific because it is like a reversals like the, the pictures are depictions of the reverse meaning of the cards. So it's it's very specific. So I want to say it's my favorite deck because it kind of is, but it feels too specific in its use to just be like my general favorite. But I'm obsessed with it. This is a, what's it called when there's lots of different artists? I think every card is a different artist or almost every card is a different artist. And that's not a type of deck that I am generally drawn to. If anything, it usually puts me off a deck. It actually also has like these really beautiful gilded edges. It's really, really beautiful quality. The art is incredible. It feels cohesive despite having different artists. The guidebook is amazing. I like, I just am so in love with this. It has that dark fantasy vibe for me, which if you know me at all, you know that I love. And if you're a little bit scared by like the shadowiness of this deck or the fact that it depicts reversals, the guidebook really gives like a sense of like a light at the end of the tunnel kind of vibe to it. Like it does address the shadow or reverse meaning of the cards, but if that is kind of like a more negative message, it doesn't leave you feeling like hopeless or screwed or whatever. So I'm so obsessed with this one. I can't say it enough. And what I did actually was I paired this one with the Journey Tarot for my like kind of month ahead type of reading. I don't do it like predictively. I always say like I don't really read predictively anyways, but I kind of paired these together like a, hmm, how can I, can I show this? Like I did like a as above, so below type of vibe. Like I had two of these up here and then I had, oh, I won't be able to show it properly. Okay, let's just do them side by side. Wow, we're really all over the place today. Okay, so I did kind of like a, um, like conscious and subconscious or, you know, as above, so below, like I said, type of type of vibe with these two. And again, like I, as I'm looking at this and showing it to you now, like I don't think like aesthetically they look amazing together, but I think because they both have that kind of fantasy theme to them, they read well together. 
So anyways, really loving both of these. And then we're gonna, okay, we can get rid of the journey tarot now. We're done talking about that, but we're gonna keep the corrupted tarot because this one is gonna make another appearance. So the last deck that I'll talk about is this one that I forget the name of right now. It's called the Wild Things, Wood Wild Things something. Everything is always linked down in the description. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't keep this one in the box because I actually keep this on my dresser in my bedroom in like a little box thing that my fiance gave me. But I love this one so much and again this one like feels very shadowy but this one has kind of become actually like my nighttime deck recently this is another one that kind of feels like it acknowledges like the darkness but there is also like acknowledgement that like the dark cannot exist without the light so there's so much beauty in it i think that the guidebook is really beautifully de or depicted written I love the art. It's very like dark fantasy, kind of creepy, kind of cute. The keywords or phrases down at the bottom are very unique as well. And I found that this pairs really beautifully with my Corrupted Tarot. So when I got the Corrupted Tarot, I actually thought about getting this Oracle to pair with it. There was another one on Etsy that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head but I was kind of leaning a little bit more towards that one for some reason. I don't really remember why. But anyways, I don't have it. And I was like, I have these, let's give them a shot. And I think they actually work really well together. They both have that kind of like darker theme. Is this lighting awful? Is that better? I swear, it's like it's spring and winter's over and I still just cannot seem to get this lighting <laughs> right. Anyways, hopefully, as you can see, and you agree, I think these pair really well together. I just think aesthetically they look good together. I think that the messagings in both of them are so thematically connected that it works really well. And I like that despite them both being like more shadow worky, darker type of decks, that they both give so much hope and they're both like really comforting in a way as well so I don't know I have absolutely been loving these together oh my gosh so that's it that's everything I feel like I've been filming this video all day I don't know how long it's actually gonna be but if you stuck around for the whole thing and if it's actually long thank you well even if it's short and you stuck around <laughs> thank you Anyways, I hope you guys are all doing awesome. Thank you so much for being here. As always, keep your mind strong and your little heart soft, and I will see you very soon. Bye, guys.